Hello, everybody. We are ready to start our second session. Uh, this session is on ischemic heart disease, the role of, of uh, non-invasive imaging. And um, I'm John Mamarian, uh, one of your moderators. Dr. Berman will be joining us. And uh, the first talk today will be on risk stratification and CV prevention. What is the value of imaging? When is calcium scoring or, cult or cardiac ultrasound indicated by Dr. Verani, who's, uh, at the, uh, who's a assistant professor of uh, medicine at, at uh, Baylor? Dr. Verani. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mamarian, Dr. Zagby, for the invitation. So what the topic that I've been given is how do we use imaging for primary prevention in terms of risk stratification? Uh, these are my uh, sources of research support and disclosures, none of which are related to the talk. So first, I mean, I think the question is that why do we need imaging uh, for, to further risk stratify our patients in primary prevention? Remember, these are patients that you and I see every day in our clinic, and we're trying to decide which patients should receive intensive medical therapy. Lifestyle is for everyone, that we should do on everyone. If we are going to start statin therapy, aspirin therapy, aggressive blood pressure reduction, which patients are the ones that we really should be focusing on? And I believe this is where the field is moving because this is where the money is. So again, you know, uncertainty is very hard. Now, if you look at the traditional risk stratification algorithms that we have, you know, the most common one we use is the pool cohort risk equation by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, as per the 2013 guidelines. Well, we're pretty good in terms of gradation of risk that, yes, this group is 5% 10-year risk of having a cardiovascular event. This group is 15%. But then at the individual patient level, we're not very sure. We over-treat a lot of patients. And to some extent, we may under-treat some, and we may not treat some who may end up having an event. Overall, it does very well, but then there are holes in there whereby we may over-treat some and we may under-treat some. So what I want you to do in the next step, uh, 15 minutes that I've been given is to just very quickly go through what is really the, the value of carotid IMT or carotid plaque in identifying individuals at high risk of ACVD events. Just give you some very quick data. I think this is a very well-read group, so I'm not gonna get into very many details of each of the studies, just give you some summary slides. What's the value of coronary calcium in ident identifying individuals at high risk? Now, and then we'll talk about what the current guidelines say. Remember, these three parts of the talk are more in terms of identifying patients in whom we would intensify treatment. But the next question is the question of de-risking patients. Well, are we over-treating some patients where imaging can help us identify which patients we don't need to treat, even if they meet the treatment threshold per our, our uh, ACVD, risk stratification algorithms like pool cohort risk equation? So that is another concept that has come out in the last, I would say, five to six years. And it's been very well adopted by a lot of uh, uh, preventive cardiologists, so I'll talk about that. And then statin is obviously something that we all talk about, but then identifying candidates for aspirin therapy, which remains very controversial, and some intensive blood pressure lowering based on sprint trial results where imaging can be helpful. These are just some food for thought uh, based on some of the studies that have been done in the last year or so. So first of all, carotid IMT, again, you know, we know that the IMT definition is it's the distance that exists between the lumen intima interface and the media adventitia interface, which again, you know, this group knows this is the lumen to intima interface, this is the media to adventitia interface. You measure it, you can do it in common carotid, you can do it at the bifurcation or internal carotid. And when we look at all the studies, I've put down three major studies here where it is associated with a higher risk of ACVD events. But as you know, that is not enough for a biomarker or for an imaging study these days. We have to show discrimination in terms of when you add it on top of traditional risk factors, you improve what we call the area under the ROC curve, but see how much, how minimal increase you see, which is significant by the way. And then the other aspect of this is that when you see plaque in addition to a thick IMT, that adds further. So it's extremely important when you're looking at discussions related to IMT, you gotta ask the question whether is it only IMT or IMT plus plaque? 
because it does provide further risk stratification. This is data from the ERIC study, but the same has been seen in various other studies. So once you talk about discrimination, that I, can I differentiate at a, at a larger level those who are gonna have events versus those who, who are not gonna have events, then the question is how many patients or individuals will I reclassify and correctly reclassify? If I downgraded the risk based on imaging, did they not have an event? And if I said they are going to have an event based on imaging, how many of them actually ended up having an event? And I will penalize myself for that imaging test if that did not happen, what the imaging test told me would happen. So if you do that, there's a net reclassification improvement of about nine to 10% when you look at carotid IMT. But then you are not going to do any imaging test in somebody who is very high risk or very, very low risk. So you will do it in patients who have intermediate risk of any event. And in those, if you, what we call the intermediate risk patients, and, and that is known as a clinical NRI or net reclassification, almost 20% of those patients can be reclassified using carotid IMT plus plaque. There are problems with carotid IMT, especially the measurement. Remember, a normal IMT could be 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeters. So the margin for error is very, very, very minimal. Uh, there is heterogeneity in methods, although I would say that AAC had a consensus document which is very well written from 2008. If you are thinking about it, I would highly recommend you read that. There's poor reproducibility in the near wall. And then technically it's demanding very small changes annually. I mean, if you have an IMT change of 0.1 millimeter, that's a very significant change, but you can just have that change by the angle of your transducer. So everything has to be very standardized. And the carotid reports that we currently have only report on the presence of plaque. They do not comment on the IMT. So it's not widely available. You have to go to a very good lab that is doing it. So then switch gears and talk about the second imaging test, which is extremely important in risk stratification, and that's the coronary calcium score. Again, very quick shot of the heart. It's widely available, doesn't take much time, minimal radiation, and uh, really, it's, it's, if you look at it, it's, it's fairly inexpensive these days. So again, going to the same theme, that does it help in discrimination? And these are all the AUCs when you have traditional risk factors for all the major studies. And when you add coronary calcium score, how much of an improvement in discrimination you get. And just compare these numbers to what I showed you for carotid IMT. These are definitely much, much higher numbers in terms of improvement in AUC. And that basically allows you to discriminate between those who are going to have an event versus those who are not on top of your traditional risk factors and risk scoring algorithms. So then the next question is that, can coronary calcium score help us improve our reclassification of patients? And there again, you will see that if you look at some of the major studies, total reclassification improvement, when you look at everybody, regardless of their risk by using a risk calculation, for example, the pool cohort risk equation or Framingham risk score is in the vicinity of 20 to 25% as opposed to about 9% you know, or 10% for carotid IMT and plaque. But more importantly, if you look at patients who are really your intermediate risk patients, where you are going to use imaging, you're not gonna use imaging in everyone. Very, very low risk or very high risk, there the answer is you know, you're gonna treat them based on what the risk stratification algorithm tells you. But imaging, when you use it really, look at the number where it matters the most, you're looking at 50 to 60% clinical NRI or net reclassification improvement in those patients where it matters the most. And remember, this is correct reclassification. If the imaging test inappropriately classified someone, then these numbers would go down. So we are looking at a total improvement of about 50% in terms of reclassification. So extremely important to remember those numbers if you're gonna be using them. There's also uh, one study that looked at coronary artery calcium score and compared it to carotid IMT as well as you know, FMD, as well as uh, multiple biomarkers and family history as well. And as you will see on the extreme right-hand side, carotid IMT again, about 65% uh, net reclassification improvement in those who are in the intermediate risk. And just to give you an idea, IMT did good, about 10% or so, but definitely not as good as the presence of coronary calcium score. Just remember that most of these studies that I'm mentioning here are looking at carotid IMT in isolation. They're not adding plaque 
uh, to the risk stratification. If you add PLAC, you will probably get even better risk uh, reclassification. So just keep that in mind when looking at these studies. Then the next question is, what do the current guidelines tell us? And remember, these are the guidelines from 2013. As most of you would know that the cholesterol guideline is being revised, which will also talk about risk stratification using imaging when it comes out, hopefully by the end of the year. And, but if we go by what we currently have in terms of the risk stratification guidelines from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, which were released in 2013, but formally published in 2014, that you know, for, for coronary calcium score, it's a 2B recommendation, not a very strong recommendation. It could be used, it may be used if you are in that category where you're, you're, you need some further data to do decision making. Obviously, there have been multiple studies that have come out since the publication of the guidelines, which I will let you know in a few minutes. But for carotid IMT, it was a level three recommendation, mostly because of the technical aspects of it, that it's very difficult to maintain that quality whereby you don't have so much variability from visit to visit. So that's where we are in terms of the guidelines. And as most of you would know, that the guidelines made it very clear that you could continue, you could think about statin therapy or consider statin therapy when you have these other risk factors, even if you do not meet the treatment threshold and CAT score of greater than 300 Agustin units was actually one of them. So just something important to know that the guidelines were definitely favoring to some extent that if you had a question whether to treat a patient or not, you could use these variables and calcium score was one of them. And we'll see what the new guidelines you know, say when they come out. But again, even when you have a very high calcium score, it still requires a discussion between clinician and patient. And it did not mention carotid IMT or plaque. If a mention it was against, as I showed you, it was a class three recommendation. So the next part of the, of the talk is really about de-risking. And what we know is that when we use our risk stratification tools, we really overtreat a lot of patients. This is a classic example. You know, you have a rare condition called good health. Frankly, I'm not sure how to treat it. Well, maybe a little statin will make me feel better, not the patient, you know? And sometimes we are living on the statin island. Uh, and again, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. We, I think at, to some extent, especially with our thresholds being moved down to 7.5, and I can discuss very openly, you know, when you have, you have questions as to why it was kept at 7.5, the, the threshold is real. But definitely we have some overtreatment there. So the question is that can we identify those who will not have an event because they have a calcium score of zero? And this is where the story is now. If you look at these three large analyses that have been presented, if you have zero calcium, look at your event rate. 0.47%, 0.5%, 0 0.5%. Very, very low event rates with large number of patients and decent follow-up. So when you have a calcium score of zero, your risk of having a cardiovascular event is extremely low. So then we have this study that is very wi widely uh, publicized. And let me just take you through this. This is based on the 2013 ACCHA guideline. If your 10-year risk was above 7.5% based on the pool cohort risk equation, then you would know that it's recommended to start a discussion about statin therapy. But if you look at calcium score among those patients, 40% of them have a calcium score of zero. So the next question is that if you follow those patients for 10 years, what is their event rate? Their event rate is extremely low, 4.9% versus if you have any CAT present, your event rate is almost twice that of patients who don't. So can we basically use imaging to identify those patients who may still meet the threshold but may not need to be treated or may not need to be aggressively treated. And that is really where the story is now. And this slide really summarizes that. If you have low risk patients, statins are not recommended, low 10 year risk, probably no, you should not probably be doing imaging on them unless you have some suspicion that they may have CAD based on some other things. And then if you have very high risk, you probably should not be doing it. It's in this area of where you are considering statins because it's five to 7.5% or it's recommended and in those cases, if you look, your event rate, if your CAC is zero, is 1.5, in this case, 4.6. But if your CAC is present, then you definitely get to a higher risk. 
you know, 10.4% in this case and 7.4% in that case. And then the same has been shown uh, uh, in, in another study in elderly individuals. As you know, older individuals are the ones who really, really get overtreated because age gives you the largest points when you're doing any 10-year risk calculation. Most of the 70-year-olds in this country will probably meet the 7.5% threshold. Uh, for treatment with statins. And that's exactly what was shown in this study done in elderly with a mean age, or I should say older adults, with a mean age of 69, where if you go by the guidelines, almost 86% are statin eligible. But when you stratify them either with CAC or carotid plaque presence, then you actually improve reclassification quite a bit. And these patients were followed for about you know, 2.1 years, short follow-up, but definitely imaging helped even in older adults. Uh, so something to consider when you're trying to look at risk stratification using them. The last is aspirin remains very controversial. And what, what has been shown is that if you want to, you could use calcium scores even to identify patients who are going to benefit the most from aspirin therapy as well. This is, again, data from the MESA study where if your calcium score, if let's say that your CHD risk is more than 10%, but if your CAC score is zero, this is numbers needed to harm by, by, by basically causing bleeding events. Your number needed to treat is still much, much, much higher if your calcium is zero, which means that you should not be treating them, versus if your CAC is above 100, whether your risk is less than 10% or more than 10%, you definitely have much lower numbers needed to treat compared to number needed to harm, so you should be treating them. So you could use that. These are data, again, from the MESI study looking at how your numbers come down if you treat someone to a much aggressive sprint trial-based thresholds of 120 millimeters of mercury using calcium scores. Not randomized trial, but looking at data from epidemiologic studies. And look at what happens to your numbers needed to treat. If your ACVD risk is less than 15%, your number needed to treat, if you're treating them to 120 target, comes down from 99 to 24, almost a four-fold improvement in your number needed to treat. So to conclude, disease-based imaging, when added to risk-based screening, provides incremental information. I think we all agree on that. Use of imaging can also identify individuals most likely to benefit from preventive therapies. And importantly, imaging can be used to decide when preventive therapies may not provide significant benefits. So with this, I will acknowledge uh, some individuals who've obviously you know, done a lot of work in this space, and I'll stop here. Thanks for your time.